Aristotle once observed, law is order, and good law is good order. A seemingly simple concept, but the realities of making those good laws and enforcing them have troubled society since time immemorial. From community service to capital punishment, everyone has a view on how we protect the innocent and punish the guilty. Is one man's law another man's tyranny? Is justice available to all? Does prison work? Should we lock up lawbreakers and throw away the key, or does that fail to address the root causes of crime? To discuss these questions and more, I'm joined by Stephen Merchant, award-winning writer and graduate of the University of Warwick. Hello. And Carl Pilkington. Look at that fucking head. Right. So, Carl, law and order. Not that interested in it, to be honest. What do you mean? I've got no interest in law and order whatsoever. It's not part of my life. That's the problem. You keep picking topics that don't buzz me. <laughs> of course they do. They don't. Well, let's talk interested. about this. Let's talk about this. You're, you're a man quite obsessed with law and order. Based on what? Well, law and order is basically to protect the innocent, isn't it? I mean, when we think of law and order, we usually think of crime and punishment, but it's all about protect our person. We have the right to walk the streets without getting mugged. When someone wrongs us, we want justice. It's fundamental. And you do. You were sitting in your old flat in London, phoning me every day that you wanted to go downstairs and smack their heads in for being late and shouting around and being drunk, and you could hear it. You wanted some justice. Yeah, but nothing would have happened if I called someone up and said there's people doing noise pollution. Even though there's a there's a law for noise pollution now, it's not really taken seriously, is it? Well, so it you isn't. are see, but you are you are concerned with law and order. No, you but wanted no your point. rights, and oh, you ended up moving. You've, he's moved in now. He's moved to lovely sunny Hampstead, just down the road from us. So you're having a better life. Yeah, so but I shouldn't have to move because of some noisy people. No, you shouldn't. But I'm saying you were stressed. No one cares though. And you wanted justice, but you could, you thought you couldn't get justice, so you moved away. Yeah, so I is, dealt with it in my way. Yeah, I right. hated him. Right. Because they didn't care about anyone else. Exactly. But the police wouldn't get involved. There's other people who live around there who had to put up with it. But no one cared. So what did it feel like every night when you were trying to watch telly and it's hot and you've got the window open or... No, yeah, you could just hear stuff. And other, you know, it's, it's that thing of you get a lot of tourists in London, so they're talking. It's not even as if you can listen in to what they're saying and have a, have a view on their opinion because they're foreign. <laughs> Is that, would so that you be entertaining for you? Well, yeah, because if you can hear what people are saying, you go, oh, yeah, that's a Switch good point. Switch the telly off. <laughs> <laughs> that's oh, a good point. Know, there's, there's I don't want to hear anyone talking. I'll tell you what, I feel, really feel sorry for people with, like, neighbours from hell. Because it's, I, yeah. I, I, I mean, you know, I'm not saying it's justified, but I can see why people go mental with someone when they're bullied or, you know, constantly harassed and no one cares. And when you can't go to the police, you can't go to the police and go, there's a bloke next door, he's got his telly on to he's always pissed, he's shouting about, if you don't do something, I'm going to go around there um, and crack his head in. You, you'll be the one that... But isn't it your own fault for living in central London? Well, not really, because it wasn't always like that. I'd been there years, and then all of a sudden... You know, good fellas turn up. <laughs> they sat down there making a racket. What can you say to them? You call down, they can't hear the phone ringing. Could I just say that good fellas wasn't a pizza joint? He no. called the loud people that because he thought they were gangsters because right, they sure. did what they wanted and yeah. sat outside and. Yeah. So, uh, but it's louder. I think it is louder abroad than it is here. Whenever I go away on holiday, I always notice that it's always a couple of decibels higher. Really? Always. Like the sound of bird noises and that are louder abroad, <laughs> because they're trying to get a nut above the noise of the noisy people. No, that's not true. They are. When I was in, where was I? Menorca or something. It was like lying there. If it wasn't a noisy local, it was the people in the villa next door. If it's not them, they suddenly collected the bottles from the bottle bank. That's a nice noise when you when you're just relaxing. The bottle bank. Just pop that there where the villa is. So that was a racket. There was always some. There was just so much noise. Animals, so, creatures. You can't. Noise. You can't escape. It's the one thing you can't escape. Noise. Your ears never turn off. No. They're always there. But I've told you before. Wear earplugs if you have to. I don't like it. But he doesn't like. He, can, he says he can hear the sound of his own art. <laughs> well, there's always a sound. Like your eyes, you can close them. My eyes close all the time, and if, if Blinky, I don't like the look blinky. of something, yeah. no, but yeah. if I don't like the look of something, they they close before even I've thought about <laughs> if I want to see it or not. <laughs> what, do think, what do you think exactly? I just mean if if I see something on the telly or like one of those casualty programs or something, yeah. 
it's like my eyes know that I'm not going to like the look of it. But no, no, no. <laughs> so no, they close no, no, quicker. No, 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 no. My ears, they, oh. they seem to be interested in everything. <laughs> <laughs> Even though I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> no. what, what I mean is, you can't close your ears. Yeah, you that's can't. what I'm saying. Exactly, yeah. You can't, you can never. So that's no, why I love the idea that your eyes are closing when you were. Oh, I was watching that. Yeah, what are you doing, eyes? Have your eyes, have your no, eyes I mean, ever closed something that you're going to No, they normally get it right. Your eyes aren't <laughs> making any decisions. Right. You're making decisions. You turn away because you don't like seeing something. You don't turn away and then you're going, what was that? And your eyes are going, you don't want to know. <laughs> you do not know. Wanna, you don't well, know I'm just Carl. saying, anyway. Mm, lovely pair of tits here. Oh, oh. Whoa. <laughs> I just mean oh. noise pollution. It's the it's the one thing you can't escape. It seems to me, from what you've said so far, is that these things happen to you, and you feel wronged, but you either want to close your eyes and ears so you can't tell it's happening, but it's carrying on, or move away from it so you're not a victim anymore, but it's carrying on. But the thing about law and order is. Um, you don't have to take it. You don't have to walk away. You can do something about it. You can combat being wronged. And I suppose we associate that with justice. It's not just punishment or retribution. It's justice. You want to know that you're valued. Uh, you know, is, well, this is a big issue, isn't it, Rick? Is, is, you know, is one life more important than another? Um, if you've transgressed in a terrible way... Um, you've murdered, or raped, whatever, and I say I'm going to put you to death because you are, you you do not belong in this society. You you are, are too transgressive. What what's to stop me? What, why, well, why is that is wrong? Why is that a morally wrong thing to do? Well, Carl? this is a, an interesting argument, isn't it? Whether capital punishment. Now, I I don't agree with execution, state execution, of someone, whatever they've done, for many reasons. But the main one is, I don't think you can have a state that shows that sort of violence against an individual, whatever they've done, and expect people to accept the very code and morality of treating people equally and not showing violence towards them. Carl, where do you stand on the tricky issue of capital punishment? You've given it some serious thought, I imagine. Um, so what, you're asking me, like, should he be, should he, should he be on death row? Well, should, should someone flip the switch, send him to his death in the electric chair? Um. Yeah. <laughs> that was the, that was the that. least considered. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I saw a little bit of flicker behind the eyes. I don't know what. Well, just take us through the mental process that you that you arrived at the yes with there. So you you know, I remember because there was a, quite a brief gap there. I just was thinking, it's not a nice job if you work in there and you got to flick the switch. Right. But I was wondering if if it's possible to just do it so it's linked up to someone's switch. What do you mean? When they put the lights on or something. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like sometime tonight when the sun goes down and people start putting the lights on in their house, it could happen. But we don't know what household. They might be away on holiday. So you might get an extra two weeks. <laughs> but at least that way... Because for me, well, the worst, well, the worst... you say that. This is not... The question I asked was whether... We were talking about the morality of whether you put someone to death. But he was thinking about... He was the, thinking the, about literally the practicality of flipping the switch. Well, no, I think that you're... Aren't you talking about the integrity of the person who n knows or knows not that they've put someone to death? Like a firing squad. Like yeah. the, what they used to do sometimes yeah. in the First World War when some, they, had, they had six riflemen, but Only five one were bullet. blanks and one right. had a... And no one knew... If they were the person that killed them, yeah. So, but what my point is, you do agree that someone should be put to death for a terrible crime, do you? You've got to have something there to stop them people who who don't care, haven't you? Nature's done it in a way with bees. They've gone, we've give you a weapon, but if you use it, you die. And that's like the bee. Well, so yeah. they're worried they're going to go. Oh, I'm not going to do we it. We do, won't we? We have we have people saying one, you can't do that. That's that's step one. Here's the law. Don't yeah, do it. But there's a lot of people Two. who go, I'm not bothered about the law. I'm not bothered about annoying people. Yeah, that's so true. So for them, at the end of the scale, you've got the chair, and you stick the wires on their head, and we'll fry your head. And they go, oh God, I don't want that. <laughs> that, that, that. That doesn't always work, does it, with, with being put to death? Because de as a deterrent, uh, most of the crimes aren't just crimes of gain with that. Some of them are crimes of passion, with, where a deterrent doesn't count, because you see red, and you, you go crazy, and you're angry, and you kill someone. Uh, I, I think a lot of those crimes 
the deterrent isn't relevant. You know, things like armed robbery, maybe, where it's a risk, what can I get versus what my crime? Maybe, maybe then it might be a deterrent. But then, of course, if you start to get a capital punishment for crimes that aren't murdering someone, then th that thing brings in you might as well murder them but because then you've got more chance of getting away with it. So it's very delicate what you make people be killed for. Um, you've made a, a, an interesting and reasoned argument there, Rick. I'm looking forward to, to hearing the riposte. Right. When I was younger, I used to nick Mars bars. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. Now, I did that then, and, uh, and I knew that even if I get caught, what's the worst that's going to happen? Yeah. It's not going to, I'm not going to go to prison over that. But it was worth nicking because the Mars bar, they were like 45 pence. Sure. When you're a kid, you can get a lot of chewing nuts for that. Chewing nuts? I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, they like caramel covered in chocolate. Last ages. Quite hard. Oh, I know. Yeah, you suck the chocolate off and then you've got to chew Horrible. them until they're... Yeah, I know, yeah. Now, I could afford them at ten pence a bag there. They'd last me sort of a morning. Um, a Mars bar was a proper treat. Mm. There's a lot going on in there. A lot of yeah. chocolate, a lot of caramel. Yeah. Like, like saying 45 pence. Yeah. So, to so me... That was, that was like an advert that went wrong just at the end. <laughs> they started off good. They go, this fly's good. He's uh, you go there. Mars bar, there's a lot in it. It's like, oh, good, keep going. Yeah, it's got, it's got caramel. It's like, yeah, 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 yeah. But it's 45 pence. It's too fucking much, so fucking nick it, you gone. <laughs> but, when I was younger, that was worth a risk. Because I knew that I'd be getting something worth 45 pence yeah, for free. You weren't going to get the electric And I wasn't going to get done. Mm. So, the stakes were high, the risk were low. No, wait, 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 wait. You mean the stakes were high, the risk were low? <laughs> I think he's just trying to sound cool. The stakes weren't high. The stakes are what can happen to you and the risk. The stakes and the risk are the same. The risk is the stake, okay? Yeah, unless you're nicking meat from a butcher's, then the, the stakes are high and the risk is low. I don't know what the fuck you're talking about, but what you meant was it the was game the was high. The game was the, high. Yeah. The game was high. Yeah, the risk was low. Yeah. But it's not, wasn't, it wasn't, was it? Because 45p isn't a lot unless you're it a kid. It is when you're a kid. It is when you're a kid. Because I was getting 50 pounds. But they're surely pounds. getting caught for nicking a Mars bar's higher when you're a kid. No, it's not. Look, you see, most of the time, I didn't want to say which shop it was that I nicked it from, but it's where I did my paper around. Now, the thing is... <gasps> so it's nicking from your own boss? Nah, but listen, I used to oh, wake him up. that I is him terrible. Run. No, because I... That is terrible. This is awful. That Go is, on, hang on, I want to hear him. Really no, I want to hear him rationalise his, his terrible Because that sweet crime. old man who used to give... He's <laughs> not an old man. I used to go around sweet and wake him up, man. right? He yeah. hated running that place. Right. Uh, if anything, I'd say I was his best asset. <laughs> well, not really. <laughs> yeah. Because I don't know he was what... nicking from him. He was yeah, nicking I, from him. No, I don't know how business. much he made on papers, but he'd probably go 45 free profit. Hold on. I They got their papers really early because I, I got up early. Yeah. I used to go around to the well, shop. Well, you know, Mars Day four. helps you work, rest, and steal. So, <laughs> so I used to go around there, wake him up. He'd be like, What are you doing around here so early? <laughs> <laughs> Don't know, I'm just hungry. What? I'm just I'm just hungry for work. No. Oh well good well, good boy bit. I'm just gonna turn away a minute. Yeah, um yeah. while you stand there in front of the confectionery. Um mm. I turn away now and I'm looking back now and here's the papers. And yeah. thanks so much, Carl, because you you're a lovely it's kid. Like an honourable and trustworthy yeah, I can't guy. really afford to I've uh, been betrayed so many times that's why yeah. my lovely wife's no longer with me, you know, she ran off with Ken. Yeah. But uh, I mean at least I've got a friend. At least I've got you, one young friend. You turn friend. up early, you're oh god, it, it's brilliant. Oh and Carl, keep a look out. Cause, um, Someone's been nicking Mars bars. Yeah, I know, I know it's, I know it's not you because I trust you implicitly. And, uh, and, uh, and by the way, Carl, why don't you take a Mars bar for free? Oh, thanks. Well, that never happened. Right. <laughs> so I'm getting fifty pence a day for delivering papers, mm. but I needed the energy. Right. Now, if I if I spent my fifty p on a Mars bar, yeah, five p profit a day is not worth it. No. So help yourself. I knew I was doing a no, good no, job no, for you. No, 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 no,
Have a little bit of uranium. <laughs> a lovely little bit of uranium. Yeah, yeah. That'd do. That'd do. That's, a, that's a strange analogy, Rick. It's <laughs> 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 sort of left straight from a bloke nicking stuff from work. Do you watch the power plant? He's having himself a bit of uranium. What's he doing with the uranium? Wow. You know, Mars a day and all that, and that's for energy, and so's uranium. <laughs> but more energy than the Mars bar. <laughs> yeah. I never nicked. I never nicked because I couldn't bear the shame. Even as a kid, I knew that was shameful. I want a clear conscience. I want to go to bed and, and sleep at night. And I do, Carl. I haven't got restless leg syndrome or more people shouting out my window. So I sleep at night because I've got a clear conscience. And that, to me, is what guides me. Well, it's like when I first moved to London and I was travelling, when I was living in Oval, I was travelling across London all the way to Shepherd's Bush every day. That's a big, long, 45-minute, hour-long journey. And uh, there, was, there were not barriers at either end in those days. So I could get on the tube at one end and get off the other end and no one ever checked my ticket. And I was buying tickets every day for months and months and months and it was starting to seem to me weird. I was like, well, no one's ever checking this. So, of course, you know, got a little bit lazy. Maybe I stopped buying tickets occasionally, taking the trip back and forth, boom, 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 boom. And then for maybe a month, travelled without a ticket. And then I was coming up, kind of got a bit blasé, obviously, coming up in Oval Station. Someone steps up and says, excuse me, can I see your ticket? Uh, and that's terrible because oh. when you're in when you're in your mid twenties, it's not like a kid anymore. Oh, no. I mean, you are an adult. You've made a reasoned decision there. You can plead ignorance. So, um, so I said, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Yeah, do you let me see a ticket, please? I went, yeah, yeah. I was, I was looking through because I had, for some reason I used to keep a lot of old tickets. And I was looking through, pretending to look for my ticket. I went, oh, I don't know what's happened to it, but I did. I did actually. I bought one at Shepherd's Bush, um, and they went, okay. If we phone up Shepherd's Bush and there's no evidence of you buying a ticket, you can go to prison. I'm going to ask you again, have you got a ticket? No. Oh, no. no. I'm embarrassed. It was unbelievable. Being told off is worse. It's worse, Well, it's because there's people walking by and I'm being told off by a woman who is at least a foot and a half shorter than me, wearing a uniform. And it was so embarrassing. It was so cripplingly embarrassing. Yeah. And I asked you again, have you got a ticket? No, I haven't. No. So you lied? Yes, I did, yeah. Okay, we're going to have to take your details. But honestly, being told... And that's it. It's the shame. Maybe it's a, a good bit of upbringing, unlike Carl, obviously, who's, you know, who's a man who's got no guilty conscience at all about the whole Mars bar incident. But whereas yeah. you and I, Rick, are raised, obviously, by better parents, yeah. and we uh, we are... It's been drummed into us, you know. How to, much to is that train journey? <laughs> Is, you know, we do feel that guilt, and that's maybe one of the reasons why we don't transgress. Because this is an interesting, you know, we talked earlier about the murder thing. Well, of course, there's that sort of uh, idea which has often been used in films. You know, in a godless universe, and if you do not feel guilt, what's to prevent you from committing a murder? If you can get away with it, if you could commit a murder, let's say you wanted to, and you could get away with it, and there is no one to judge you in a godless universe, and you can live with the guilt... Boss to stop you doing it. Well, I'd just like to say now, it is a godless universe. As an atheist, there is no God. And uh, uh, and I'm a, a good person, not because I'm going to get rewarded for it in heaven, because that's the way I want to live my life in a society that treats people like that. So um, a lot of the laws of the land, um, not just in the country, in many countries, are from the Bible. I mean, that that's that kicked it off. I mean, there was laws before, obviously, and there were there were different gods before before this one. Um, was invented, um, but let's have a look at the Ten Commandments. Oh, yeah. I think that lays down most of the. Uh, a lot of them are good rules of thumb. You know, we've got to go along with them. They didn't. They certainly didn't invent those rules of thumb. I think that um, mankind were adhering to most of them before it was handed down. So uh, let's have a look at them. There's a website here, a Baptist um, Christian website forum, uh, and this guy. I sh maybe I shouldn't say his name. I mean, he's put it up there for public, but I, I don't want to embarrass him. He says, uh, brethren and sistren. <laughs> what? Yeah, so I don't, I, uh, Never heard I've, I've learned a word. Yeah. Um, brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. Could have uh, said, said that, but he's not. He's yeah, just a classic. He could have said people. Could have said people, could have said folks, say folks. Um, it has come to my attention that not only are many of our members unable to correctly recite all the Ten Commandments, it's probably a big problem. I don't know, he goes around testing and going, number three, <laughs> um, get out. <laughs> Go and learn it. But those who can remember, even a few, invariably get the sequence wrong. Is that important? Oh, well it is. He says, let me set the record straight. The commandments do not come in a random sequence, with the exception of seventh commandment, an obvious anomaly. Why? Well, he reckons that thou shalt not commit adultery 
at number seven should really be sixth in terms of severity. Let me explain. The commandments appear in order of severity. Right. The harsher the punishment, the closer to the top. I hope this handy colour chart will make the intrinsic beauty of God's word more comprehensible to all. So this is it. He's laid it out. Commandment. Number one. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Okay? Alert level. Severe. <laughs> Punishment. Genocide. Whoa. Entire cities with men, women, children and animals must be killed. So that's a lovely, nice Christian view there. So um, if you worship another god yeah. before the right god he doesn't he doesn't name him by name he just uses the uh <laughs> the term god sure but there's only one according to um this genocide this, yeah anyone who worships another god genocide entire cities with men women children and animals must be killed i don't know what the animals have ever done but oh, well, uh, well, yeah okay nice so thing. that's number one that's the that's the most severe worshiping the wrong god sure okay number two thou shalt not make unto thee any craven image. Okay, okay, no craven images. That's, uh, I assume, so druids, devil worshippers, anything like that, isn't it? Uh, well, I think it's also just, uh, I suppose it's kind of images that mock or degrade the Almighty. Okay. Uh, What's the punishment there? Genocide. Genocide um, again. He's, wow. uh, that's a, that's a, his favourite there. Genocide. Entire cities with men, women, children and animals must be killed. What worries me is we're a couple of smart guys and we're not entirely sure what that commandment means. No. So we could go, but we could accidentally... Yeah. Three. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I assume God made these, did he? He's, he's used the first three talking about himself here. <laughs> alert level high. Capital punishment. Oh, so capital punishment. Just, so you're just, just, no, God. no, no. You're just going to be, God. yeah, you're just going to be put to death there. Not, not all your friends and family and okay, dogs. Yeah. Sure. Um, <laughs> leave the budgie. No. <laughs> Number four. Remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. Uh, high. So uh, alert level high. High, yeah. Capital punishment. Death. Capital punishment again. Yeah, you forget for the, the holy for, day. Well, what, what makes me laugh is that sometimes you could be walking along and you go, all right, yeah, okay, all right, I'm just going to, to I keep thinking it's Monday. You what? <laughs> you forgot it's Sunday. <laughs> no, I just forgot. <laughs> ah, death. <laughs> Number five. Honour thy father and thy mother. High. Okay, so, and if you don't honour your mother... Capital though, punishment. Capital punishment. A lot of death. Again. A lot of death. Again, at the moment. Is so, it? Yeah. so strict. Yeah. We haven't even got to thou shalt not kill yet, and yet he's killed everyone so Whoa, far. Oh, jeez. Um, now, seven, he's put a number six here. He's put them out of order, six and seven, because he thinks this is higher. Thou shalt not commit adultery. High. Capital punishment. Capital punishment again. Now, the fellow who did this website, he, uh, he's put thou shalt not commit adultery above thou shalt not kill. God, I did it the other way around. God, <laughs> right. thou shalt not kill, but this but fella, this fella yeah. I reckon his wife played away. Right, right. So he yeah. went, right, I'm putting them in a different order. Because before, let's see, number six, he's put um, thou shalt not kill, alert level, elevated, capital punishment in some cases. So if you murder someone, you can sometimes be killed. If you commit adultery, always, always death. get killed. So uh, I think he's made th that he can have his wife put to death, right? Or he could kill her, but maybe get off with it. Right. That's why right. he's done that. Um, number eight, thou shalt not steal, guarded, excessive fines. <laughs> Only in rare cases covered with punishment. Oh, just excessive fines? Yeah, excessive. Um, number nine, thou shalt not bear fault wit witness to thy neighbour. Uh, so basically lying low. Despisement and scorn. Is that the punishment? Yeah, for lying. Yeah, despisement, despisement and scorn. Despisement and scorn? Yeah. Thou shalt not covet, really. Don't, don't, don't try and get stuff. Don't be jealous of stuff and try and punishment. get it. Uh, despisement and scorn. Despisement and scorn, sure. I'm just going to go through, I'm just going to go down these, see which ones I, um, I commit. Uh, thou shalt have no other god. I don't have any god, so I haven't broken that one. Two, craven images. No, I don't have any craven, uh, I, don't, I don't accept there's a god to. Uh, three, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord. I, again, I don't take his name in vain because I don't believe he exists, so I'm fine there. Uh, remember the Sabbath. I always remember Sunday. Um, <laughs> I know, I, I've got a calendar and everything, so I haven't done it now. Uh, honor thy father, yeah, I do that. Uh, never commit adultery, don't do that. Um, ever killed I've anyone? No, never killed anyone. Don't steal. I don't lie. And I don't covet. So, I am an amazing Christian. Pretty clear, yeah, you're a pretty clean living guy. Wow. There you go. Well, uh, whereas, I don't know, Carl, have you ever, what's your view? You I still, um, still open, like, posts, that isn't for me. I'm um, just going to see that's um, on there. That's, 
Opening other people's post, alert level, low, punishment, embarrassment. You have to walk along with your trousers around your ankle, saying I'm a div. <laughs> Why do you open other people's mail? Uh, but it's just it's just a fella called Bruce who uh, he's the bloke who used to own the flat before me, and uh, I don't know. I started off and I thought, oh, should I pass it on? You know, because when people move, it's a lot of messing about tracking down where they've gone. Mm. So I thought, should I just leave them for a bit? And I collected some for a bit, and then there was one that sort of said, this is uh, important on the front of it. So I thought, how important is it? So I opened it. <laughs> what was it? Was it important? Uh, not really. It was from a tattooist. <laughs> <laughs> what did they say? It was just something they about... They said, a, oh, we use the AIDS needle on you. <laughs> yeah. can, you can you come in for a little test? <laughs> so I just uh, I just started... Th I just kind of thought, oh, I'll start opening it, having a look. And it was it was weird because... Do you know like how you get fed up of being yourself? No, but go on. Well, I'm intrigued. Have, of course. No, you can just have days where you're like... What I wish is I was going Brad Pitt, on? yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, and Bruce and, Willis in your case. Well, eh? well this this bloke was Bruce, so yeah. I just go, oh, let's see what you know. If I, if I was Bruce, yeah. would I be happier being him? Do you know, like yeah. I've said to you before, yeah. you never know if you don't feel well because they can't put you in someone else's body to sort of compare. No, well, most people can just use their imagination. Yeah, sure. And, and so I sort of think they don't actually need to physically go into someone else's body to understand. That yeah, like terrible. ghost. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I think, well. Would I enjoy being Bruce more? Sure. And what, so what have you what have you gleaned from Bruce? What's the, he's uh, got a tattoo. We know that. Uh, there wasn't that much. It was, it was mainly busy at Christmas. A lot of Christmas cards, which were good because I didn't yeah, get that Yeah. Oh many. yeah. He's so you just you put up these Christmas up. you put up these Christmas cards. That's, what that's, you had Christmas cards <laughs> hanging in your flat? To, to, to have a lovely Christmas, Bruce. Yeah. Auntie Jean. <laughs> that's crazy. Well, hang on a minute, because when you put them on your you know your mantelpiece or your shelf or whatever, you're not yeah. you're not looking at them every day. It's just a picture of Father Christmas. It doesn't matter who it's to or from. But why or, have them up at all? Well, why not just buy just some make blank Christmas? You can yeah. just buy some blank cards yeah. and put them up. Use them every no, year. No, I don't have to. Bruce has got a lot of friends. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> it was more awkward, right? <laughs> Because the bloke downstairs, because I, because I used to always collect the stuff for Bruce, I got talking to a bloke who's in the same block, and like he used to see me picking stuff up for Bruce. He'd always say, you know, all right, Bruce. No, you've never told him that you're not Bruce. Well, no point. In the pub I used to drink in, the landlord got it into his head that I was Steve, right? And you don't mean me? No, no, no. no. Exactly. Steve. Yeah, no. Right. This is before I met you. This is like twenty-five years ago, and he called me Steve. And it got to the point I couldn't correct him. Yeah. Because I because it would have been embarrassing for him, and so after about two years, um, we were playing cards, and someone said Ricky, and he went, "Who's Ricky?" And I went, "Ricky," and I just went red. I went, he went, "What do you mean, Ricky?" I went, uh, "Yeah, that's my name." He went, "You," he said, "What do you mean, fucking Ricky?" I went, "Ricky," and I looked at him. What do you mean, Steve? I went, I went, no, it's not Steve. He went. He said, well, I've been calling you Steve for two years. I went, have you? <laughs> like denying I'd ever heard him call me Steve. <laughs> oh, this guy, right? He, um... But hang on, did he, did he, what happened? What was the fallout from it? He's just sort of like, he was a bit confused. Yeah. And then, and then, uh, I think he still called me Steve for a little while, but it, sometimes it was Ricky, sometimes it was Steve. It was, it was fine, right? But, um, this guy, right? He was, uh, he was a bank robber. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he'd done he'd done um, seventeen years in all. In okay. prison. In prison, yeah. And um, I, I was sort of, I was a bit scared of him. I'm fascinated. He was he was fine. He was he was done now. He'd gone straight, totally straight, and he was running this pub. And um, I remember once he'd, he'd tell me stories about it, and he'd, he'd go on about his. Uh, he did it with four people, and um, they all did they all did time. And he said, he said, but you wouldn't recognise them now, he said. He said, they are the most respectable people you'd ever seen. He said, yeah, they're just uh, lovely businessmen, height of sophistication now. He said, you, you'd never guess. Right? And then one day, he came over to me, it was a busy pub, he went, Rick, Steve. <laughs> he said, you know those geezers I did the prime with, the, the other three? He went, yeah, he said, they are in the pub here now, see if you can guess who they are. I said, you'll never guess who they are. I looked around, I saw three blokes in sheepskin coats with tinted hair covered in gold sovereigns and gold necklaces. And I went, no, who? He went, those three. I went, you are joking. You are fucking joking. 
That was his idea of turtles with biscuits. Tint, they had tinted beards, but they looked like they looked like fat Bee Gees covered in gold and sheepskin. It was unbelievable. It was, I went, oh, that is that is a surprise. <laughs> that is a surprise. I thought they were barristers. <laughs> oh, unbelievable. I was always terrified of being mugged when I first moved to London. Um, and you remember, Rick, I uh, had a wallet with all my stuff in, and then I took to carrying a fake wallet, That's lovely. Okay, which I had some sort of old library cards and DVD cards, you know, video shop cards and stuff, and like I put a fiver in there, you know. And then I got really anxious because I thought, what if I hand over my fake wallet, and he goes, well, it's a fake wallet. Okay, then I got to hand over the real wallet, but maybe he also punishes me, you know, takes it out of me because he's angry. So then I took to carrying a second fake wallet. So I spent about two months carrying three wallets around, <laughs> two of which were fake, right? And then, do you know the reason I stopped? Because I thought, what if he, I give him both fake wallets, I give him one fake wallet, he opens it, he goes, well, this is a fake wallet. I give him the second fake wallet, he, now he's going to be twice as angry as he would have been if he only had the one fake wallet. And then I was thinking, what, but what if I do give him the fake wallet, and then he just starts using the library cards and the video cards, you know, and he could run up a huge fine. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be, yeah. I'd be in the same position I'd be like giving the money. Yeah, I also, I don't believe you'd ever put a fiver in the fake wallet. You wouldn't <laughs> be willing to, yeah, yeah. I had a run in with crime. I was, uh, ripped off. Really? In, in a big sting operation a few years ago. Um, I was at home and I was just, I was rushing out and uh, the phone went and it was my bank. Yeah. And I went, is that Mr. Vase? I went, yeah. He went, um, have you recently bought £200,000 worth of gold bullion? <laughs> and I went, um, I went, Jane! Are we, are we did bought, are we bought two, well, what? Are we bought two hundred thousand pounds of gold bullion? Went, no, of course not. Went, no. Went, oh, um, well, someone's, uh, taken that money out of your bank account, uh, fortunately, and, uh, and they've purchased gold. And I went, right, okay. They went, um, we'd like your permission to get the CID involved. I went, well, yeah. I said, of course. I said, but hold on. You know it wasn't me then. Um, so do I get the money back? And they went, yeah, you, all the money will be, um, put back into your bank. I went, fine. I said, yeah. I basically went, yeah, fill your boots. Hmm. And they went, um, and can you come down? I went, oh, yeah. So I arranged the time. I went down to the bank. There was the CID there waiting. And, uh, well, it turned out it was sort of an inside job. Someone who did some sort of random, um, checking of facts. You know, they phone you up and say you're happy with the service. They put down the phone and went, oh, you never go so I spoke to that Ricky Gervais. Right, right. And, um, someone overheard they were involved. They'd got a payoff from Mr. Big somewhere. Mm. It was out of the country. And, uh, but so... But isn't there more... I mean, you can't just... Even if you work in a bank, you can't just walk off with cash, can you? There must have well, been a more elaborate... Yeah, they did a transaction, didn't they? They mm. okayed the transaction like it was me for these people. And then these people bought gold with it. And now all they have to do is go and collect the gold. Now, this is the tricky bit. So, what they don't know is, now the bank know that it's not me collecting it. Right. So whoever turns up for the gold, they said they're probably just be, they might even be innocent couriers. Yes. But then we get, you know, the go, the go betweens or whatever. And where is a gold, where is gold bullion kept? I it's don't just, know. It's just, um, I suppose you go and, to go and get it from a, um, a vault somewhere right. and, uh, and, and take it away and take delivery of it. I, I, I don't know if it literally changes hands uh, or not. So what they need is obviously my passport. Mm. So, uh, they got the people, so it was going to go to court. Okay, I didn't have to go to court, but, um, I had to have a meeting with the CID for all the details and take the, you know, that uh, it wasn't me and all that. Yeah. So, the funny thing was, I'm there with a the CID man, and I said, well, how did they, how did they think they were going to get away with it? And they said, well, they, they turn up with, um, a, a fake passport of yours, show the ID and I walk away. I went, right, okay. And they said they get a, um, a passport from a, a, either a dead man, or they steal one, and they uh, replace it with your details and your picture. And the CID man started smirking. Right? I went, "What?" He said, uh, "Well, they, um, the picture they used was this one." And he showed me this fake passport. And I tell you what, I was laughing. I, we, we, then he started chuckling, and we laughed for about ten minutes because all they did was they cut out the picture on the first series of The Office from the DVD. So it's a picture of David <laughs> Brent sitting behind the desk with that little smug look on his face. <laughs> That's my passport in this thing. So, I mean, uh, they might have got caught anyway. Yeah. It's nice to know that even such, you know, elaborate operations as this, it still comes down to just idiocy, criminal well, incompetence. Who was left in charge of getting a photo? <laughs> yeah. I mean, they go, uh, uh, you know, Dave, 
you're uh, you're you're doing so and so and so. You're Julie, you're on the inside. Da, 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 da. Uh Bertie, <laughs> can you get a picture? Yes. <laughs> you yeah. can get you can get a photograph of Ricky Gervais, can you? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Right, okay. Where are you go you go what are you going to H M V for? What are you going to H M V for? I knew we shouldn't have recruited someone who looks exactly like Bernard Breslau. <laughs> it's unnerved yeah. me. Carl, it has been kind. There's always someone doing well out of me. There's always someone, if, I go, if, if they're a little bit short, you know, we'll go around to Pilkington. But that, I mean, three off. or four times a day. Sometimes I call him up and he goes, right, the washing machine's broken, they came round, they've done this, right, they couldn't fix it, but they had to call it charge 90 quid. I called the bank and said, no, they can't do that. Turns out they can't do it. It's like a string of things where you, it, it looks like Carl's handing out money, like the end of a comic book. He goes, that's for the broken window, and there's for my sausages. It's like a queue of people yeah, just yeah. taking money off Carl. I don't know, they're normally all right if I'm face to face with them. Really? Yeah, if I can sort of, you know, if I can go in a place, but a lot of stuff now is done on the phone. Yeah. You know, it's all phone, isn't it, because no one's, it's, it's all over the world where you're speaking to these people. Yeah. I was talking to someone the other day about the alarm system, right, in the flat. <laughs> Called them up, uh, thought, oh, it would be good to get this going again. Uh, you know, I have an alarm system, I haven't had one for years. Might as well use it, it's there. So, uh, I called them up and said, uh, yeah, there's an alarm system in this flat I bought. I uh, want to get it going again. What's the situation? So uh, they took a load of details and stuff. And they said, right, uh, what you have to do, uh, it's 400 quid a year. I said, what? <laughs> I said, 400 quid a year. I said, what's that for? I said, if the alarm goes off, we can guarantee that a couple will be there in like a minute and a half. <laughs> I, said, I, I, I said, I don't want that. I said, I'm just happy with the alarm just going off. I'll give the keys to the neighbour. No, you can't do that. You've got to have this this way. I said, four, four hundred, I said, I thought alarms are meant to stop you being robbed. <laughs> <laughs> Did you want to, I don't understand sarcasm no, when you're course. talking to them people. Yeah. Just to get out of your system, when you know you've been conned, you just laugh in the face of adversity. I remember um, it was um, a couple of days before Christmas, I was going away, but I had a dripping tap and it started dripping more. So uh, there was nothing I could do. The maintenance people were away. The caretakers were away. I couldn't get in. And so I, um, I called out an emergency plumber. I knew this was going to cost, but bloke came round honestly he made you look smart he was like one of those kids who looked like a lumpy child he was probably 20 yeah but he just looked like you know what i mean they yeah. scaled up a sort of 13 year old big faced lad <laughs> yeah right yeah. All right and he and he he came in and uh he didn't know how to stop it he couldn't unscrew it he went oh, i don't know what to do i called my brother he's there just that uh, i said i said uh, Bob, what can I do? He said, you could crush the pipe and then get it cut and fixed when you go. I said, great idea. So I said to the plumber, I said, can we crush the pipe? Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll go and get a tool. We went down the van, came up with this thing, like a fat sort of little pair of pliers. He couldn't, he wasn't strong enough. So I went, oh, I had a go. I said, well, let's, well, how do we both do it? So we both put our hands on it and we managed to crush the pipe, flatten the pipe, cut it off. He put a little thing on the end of it so it wouldn't leak, right? I went, great. Uh, I said, uh, how much is that? He went, 180 quid. So I went, right, okay. So I wrote him out a cheque for 180 quid and I, I thought I'd have a little bit of sarcasm. So it wasn't his idea. I helped him do it. I went, how much was that tool? He went, about five. I went, that's paid for itself, isn't it? <laughs> Silence. He went, yep. Just nothing. Just nothing. Tough crowd. Yeah, right. of course. <laughs> right. So I signed the cheque. Right? He, went, he went, oh, he said, I forgot to charge you for the little washer on the end. I went, how much is that? He went, £2.50. I went, can I give you that in cash? <laughs> and I went, yeah. I went, there you go. There's the, the £2.50 for the washer on the end. And there's the £180. <laughs> And he went, and that was it. I didn't even get a little chuckle. Oh, he didn't even think. He should have gone, well, let's split that, because we both did that. Yeah. Yeah, that's 90 quid each. I go, okay, that's worth brilliant, mate. Cheers. Here's a Christmas bonus. <laughs> I have a, a fascinating tale to tell you, Carl. I think you'll be intrigued. Um, when I do um, junkets for films in, in America or, or uh, Toronto Film Festival, um, I was assigned a, a security... And uh, um, I've had security before. I often have security. They just sort of get you in and out of the car and usually just to control sort of autograph hunters and things. And But um, this time I was given a, a security and he, he came in a, a suit. He looks about 30. He looked quite unassuming. I, I thought he was from a, just a security firm. And there was a couple of them. And uh, 
first of all they were talking to each other and I thought well the stakes are higher here I don't know I, I, I don't know why and um, they drove to the hotel and there was uh, loads of people going to the hotel I mean much bigger stars than me you know there was Ed Norton and, and George Clooney and they were going in and out and he goes I, we can go past these and he called ahead and he knew everyone he just knew everyone and we went down in the car park we were met by another security guard in the hotel that let us go past everyone I mean, Cl Clooney's having to queue up and sign. I'm thinking, this is weird. And I was a bit, a bit guilty because I was there to promote the film. And I think, this security guard's so good, I'm never going to ever have to pump into anyone. It was amazing. <laughs> and he was there the next day and he took us to the junket and back and he put us on the thing. And then it turned out that uh, he was actually LAPD, who was doing this for celebrities because he earned more money. And then... Um, I found out he had a gun, so I can't come in the airport with you, I can't take my gun. So, he's armed. So I've got a security, who's an APD, who's, who's armed, and I'm fascinated. Now I'm fascinated, this man is walking around with me with a little earpiece, talking to everyone, he seems to know everyone, and he's got a gun. I think, oh, this is amazing. Then one night, he said, uh, he dropped me off at the hotel, and he said, uh, I've actually been called, I've got to go on a mission, they need my help. I said, really, what is it? He said, it's a hostage situation, he said, and I'm... I'm also SWAT. So now I'm just, this is amazing. He's now the, officially the coolest man I've ever met in my life. So he goes off. Then I'm thinking, oh, I'm worried about him. I was talking to Jane, I was thinking, wow, he does this, he gets this amount of cash, he's risking his life, and now he's going to a hostage situation. And I was thinking, oh, God, it's, it's, just, it's just a silent hero. Mm. So next day he comes, I was, how was it? He said, I was fine. He said, I just turned up. He said, I had to, I had to do it in my suit. He said, because uh, I'm the negotiator. What? So now, he's an armed security guard, he's an LAPD, he's special SWAT, and he's one of nine negotiators in LA. We're in LA now. We've come from mm. Toronto, went via New York and LA. So I went, oh my God. And I just asked him questions for mm. two hours. Um, so the first thing that happens is, so someone runs in with a hostage. This guy, he's just a kid, he was 19, he'd done a robbery. He'd panicked and he'd run away. The police were after him. He ran in and he took his, his kid with him. It was just a, a three-year-old kid. Okay. Um, that often happens. Uh, most hostages that people take are their family because it's all they've got. And they go, oh, I'm going to kill my wife or my kid and that. And they don't mean it. They're not going to. But they need, they need a hostage. They've got a gun. So he talks to them and he's, he says things to them like, you, you know, you didn't mean this to happen. Did you? They went, no, no. I just, he, he said, they got out of hand. It just got out of hand. And he has to let them trust him because they, they've got a hatred for the police of course they don't trust the police and, that. and um, the first thing he does is call the phone company and say what's the number of this address he goes change it by one digit so now only he can call that number because of course you can't have a, an engaged signal if they haven't got a phone they have to throw a phone through a window so they've got to have contact with this guy mm. uh, you know. I said um what happens if uh, this guy says, uh, you're never going to get me out, I'm going to kill all the hostages? He said, then my sole purpose is to get him to stand near a window. And I went, wow. Now apparently, there's a police marksman ready, of course, if they think they've lost him. The important thing is you've got to take him out because you've got to protect the innocent. So how they shoot him is they shoot him in the top lip and it takes out the brain stem, so there's no reflex. And I'm just being absolutely, mm. I'm captivated. What do you think of that, Carl, as a job? It's amazing, isn't it? Um, yeah, I mean, once you've done one, though, it's like any job, isn't it, I suppose? Yeah. Once you've done one. Yeah, not boring, impressed. Boring, yeah, no, 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 it's good. Could you do uh, it? Do you reckon you could do it? Do you reckon you could negotiate someone out of a hostage situation? Well, With I think in one of them turns. things, there's nothing you can do. It's like, it doesn't matter if it goes wrong, because well, it you, does. you did your bit. No, it's like being a vet, isn't it? Not really. Not really, because well, that's well, ridiculous thing no, to it's say. No, nothing, it's nothing like being like a vet. It's no, it is. What I mean is, you're you're expected to no, no, make no. a little kit and leave. No, 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 there's loads of it. Because I was saying, so, um, so he says, I need a car by five o'clock, mm. or I'm going to kill someone. He then makes sure... That he doesn't kill anyone, but he makes sure that car doesn't come till quarter past five. Mm. Even if it's there, 
he keeps going, it's on its way, because then the hostage knows that he's not in control, really. Even if it's as easy as saying, I want my wife here, and he can get her there at five, oh, he makes sure she doesn't turn up till twenty past five. Yeah. It's just little things like that that's just absolutely fascinating. The psychology of it is just amazing. But he's not bothered, is he? He is bothered. Minutes late. He is because he he really takes a bit. He empathises with these guys, and he says, "No, you've got to understand." No, but he the says, fella in the house with the gun. Yeah, he's not going anywhere. Fifteen minutes either side doesn't matter. Well, why is he in a rush? I don't think Carl's getting out. Sure no, no, you sure said you said. Yeah. they make the car fifteen minutes late. Yeah, he's getting his car. That yeah. bloke's not in a rush. He's never going to get in the car, is he? That's the other thing as well, because um, once a, a bloke said to him, um, "I need a car," know. and he just went. Where are you gonna go? And the bloke went, uh, I d yeah, I forget that. He has to make them forget their deadlines and their demands. So soon it doesn't matter. And he has to get in their head. But to do that, he says that he has to empathise with them to a certain extent. He has to understand why they're doing it, to talk to them and go, yeah, you've had a bad day. Mm. That, that would send anyone. But he has to get their trust. Carl, try and, t try and talk me out. You think it's that easy. Right, I've got a hostage situation, right? Done a crime. I've run in the building. They go, there's only one person we can ask for. Get me Carl Pilkington. Okay. You turn up. Right, what's your so question? So you've asked me, you've asked for me to deal with this. No, 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 no. The police know that you're their top man. And there's a guy in here. He's got a gun. He's got a hostage. Okay. He's just done a crime. They don't know what to do. Okay. Right. You turn up. What's your first question to the... I'm talking to you. Well, no, you've got to assess... Right, I'd say, I'd say, right, uh, I think there's a saying, actually, there's a, you say, where's brass, right? Right. I found that out, I heard that, I overheard that. What's that? It was something, uh... You're was wasting it, time! It was, it was a, that bull cunt that's just turned up! I'm gonna fucking listen, kill it! Right, where's but, brass? What does it mean? I heard it at school when they... I don't know what the fuck you're talking about! You can't just use... It means, I heard, I heard someone use it on the... Well, I don't it's, know what the fuck it means. It All means the top person right. of, of the police who are around at the moment. Yeah, well, you talked, I'm the fucking top brass here. I've got a fucking gun against this kid's head. Who the fuck are you, you bald little shithead? Where's my car? What car? I've asked for a car. Where's my fucking car? Am I talking to you now, am I? If are you, you want, are yeah, you the, Are you the negotiator? Yeah. Right. Get me a fucking car. Where do you want to go? Oh, I'm, I'm fucking sore for shouting. Throw a phone through the window so I can talk to you over the phone. No. All right, in a minute. Don't ever fucking say no to me. In a minute, I said. Okay. Right, the clock's going. Where's this fucking right, listen, phone? Listen, listen. I've got Just a sore throat. A I've listen. got a sore throat. I can't talk anymore with that phone. I've been, I've been called up here. I can't hear you. I need I've the phone. I've been called up here. Yeah, can you go to put the phone through? Why are you putting the phone through, you dopey cunt? You want to talk to him? Because I don't want to give you a phone straight away. You said you've got to delay him. No, but they, they, you've got to talk <laughs> to them. They shouldn't even demand a phone. You should make sure you've got a phone, you dopey twat. Give him a phone. Right, thanks. <laughs> All right, how's it going? That's better. All right. Uh, right. Who are you, by the way? Who are you? Who are you? Bruce. I can't, I can't give you them details. Well, you can, because I've got to trust you, dopey sod. Are you police? Or just some fucking cunt walking by? I'm a policeman. Right, I don't trust policemen. No, but I'm a bit higher than that. <laughs> <laughs> so listen. Oh, don't you tell me I'm laying down the law here. No, listen. I'm going to shoot someone unless I get a fast car. I've done a robbery. It's all gone wrong. You're after me now, but I want a car to the airport or I want a plane standing by. You don't know me, but I do this a lot. Right? And I can tell you that it never works out right. Do you know anyone who's done what you're doing? And he's now living a happy life. Well, I don't care. I don't care about living anyway. I don't care about living now. I don't care if this goes wrong, because I'm going to shoot the hostage. What's your problem? I'll oh. just... <laughs> <laughs> I think you've got the wrong attitude, mate. I think you've got the wrong attitude here. No, but this is... The, the, to be honest with you, this was my last week. <laughs> what, why are you sending him that? Because I want to bring him down to my level. Right. What's that got to do with it? Well... You know, I've done this job for a long time. Right. And sometimes I felt like you. I've right. been, you know, even though I'm on this side, mm. you know, sometimes I feel like, oh, I've had enough of this. Right, well, I have had enough, but I I'll tell you, I don't care about living or dying here, so if I don't get a car to the airport, all bets are off. I'm killing everyone and then myself, so you're, you're, you'll be a big loser. You will be a big loser, son. 
There you go. I'll tip, give you the clue now, Carl. He doesn't care about getting away with it. Now you've got to get him to stand near a window. You've got to, you've got to take him out. Because I've got a gun to someone's head. You can't burst in, right? You've got, what, come on. How do you get him to stand near a window? Oh, I bet you're hot in there. <laughs> 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 keep going. Uh, uh, I keep am. Going. I am hot. Yeah, that's why I've just drawn the curtains and keep away from the window because the sun's blazing and it's 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 not too bad away from the window. It's uh, the sun's gone round the back now. Just come and have a look. It's a lovely, lovely evening. Why do you want me to stand near a window? I think just because when you see how nice an evening it is. <laughs> Worst, worst load of drivel ever. <laughs> worst. You see how, keep going. Oh, interesting. When you see how lovely. No, when you, it's, it's that thing. I've heard. About? I've heard that if you smile, you you, you feel better. So have a little smile. Think what? of a happy moment in your life. <laughs> I'll tell you what a happy moment in my life would be: putting a bullet through your little round head. You cunt. Keep thinking about that image. Right. And you can see that round head. Just come to the window. I'll show you the round head. That would probably work, actually. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, no, I'm not gonna come near the window. You come near the window. You come near the, my window. I'd be come. Are you coming near the window? No, not yet. What? Delaying it again. <laughs> 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 right, I, I'm coming near the window. Well, I'm gonna shoot you if you come near the window, you dopey prat. Well, why? I thought we were getting somewhere here. No, I'm gonna shoot you. I've conned you. I've, I've negotiated you to come near the window and I'm gonna shoot you in the head, you prat. I'll uh, just leave then. <laughs> well, that's about it. Um, I hope you enjoyed the Ricky Gervais Guide to Law and Order. Um, the next one in the series is the Ricky Gervais Guide to the Future, Ooh. which is out on the 29th of December. So look forward to that. Anyway, it's goodbye from me, Ricky Gervais, Stephen Merchant, goodbye, and Carl Pilkington. Mm -hmm.